Bubbles. We hear about them all the time. A bubble occurs when the price of something increases above its perceived value on a broad scale. The key idea to grasp here is a disconnect between price and value. Unfortunately, bubbles are usually driven by irrational exuberance, a term dubbed by the Federal Reserve Board Chairman Alan Greenspan. It's where asset pricing and financial markets go wrong, sometimes with disastrous consequences for an economy. This video is a brief history of some of the most well-known bubbles bubbles of all time, and hopefully what you can learn from them. Dutch tulip mania, 1637, the Netherlands. Tulip mania is widely considered as the first recorded instance of an economic bubble. The Dutch really liked flowers, and in the 1630s, the tulip was a newish luxury product in the Netherlands. A variety with striped or speckled petals was seen as particularly beautiful, and the merchant and upper class would trade tulip bulbs in hopes that a beautiful flower would eventually bloom. Contracts would be drawn up to agree to purchase a planted bulb which would flower at some point in the future. In the first few weeks of 1637, a few tulip bulbs got expensive, really expensive. One particular variety called the Semper Augustus sold for 5,500 florins. At the time, that equated to a small house in the Netherlands. The merchant class would buy bulbs with the sole purpose of reselling them at a high price, a classic signal of speculation. Some bulbs were bought and resold five times over at eye-watering premiums to their initial sale. The concept behind purchase and resale of an overpriced asset is known as the greater fool's theory. Even if you overpay for a good, you can still make a profit if you are going to sell the good to a greater fool at some point in the future. But this is a temporary trading strategy and eventually you run out of greater fools and end up holding an overpriced good that you cannot sell. As spring drew near and the tulip bulbs were close to flowering, the tulip bubble collapsed. Buyers stopped showing up to auctions, contract prices stabilized, and many buyers of planted bulbs refused to pay up when the tulips flowered. So what's the lesson here? A key one is to remember that artificial inflation of prices isn't just confined to stocks. It can happen in any asset class, even as one as unsuspecting as flowers. The crash of tulip prices didn't have a huge impact on the Dutch economy. The first recorded bubble was confined to flowers, but following bubbles would prove to be much more impactful on people's lives. The Roaring Twenties and the Great Depression, 1920 to 1929, the West. In periods of distress, such as world wars or global pandemics, consumers tend to save income and defer their spending until economic conditions become more certain. The early 20s were characterized by intense consumer spending in the wake of the First World War. Rapid technological improvements, such as the advent of radios, refrigerators, and washing machines, created a new wave of purchases. Henry Ford's assembly lines further boosted consumption as cars became more affordable to the everyman. Now everybody could have one. And many regard the Roaring Twenties as the birthplace of US consumerism. Cigarettes, cars, cereal, and televisions were all advertised to the consumer extensively. An investment banker from Lehman Brothers wrote that, the community that can be trained to desire change, to want new things even before the old have been entirely consumed, yields a market to be measured more by desires than by needs. And man's desires can be developed so that they will greatly overshadow his needs. Grim stuff, huh? The volume of production of goods and consumer confidence led to a boom in stock prices. Banks were eager to loan money to consumers and by 1927, 15% of all major consumer purchases were being made on installment plans. Borrowed money fueled financial euphoria and between 1921 and 1929, the Dow Jones Industrial Average increased sixfold. Eventually, in an effort to rein back bank lending and gambling on the stock market, the Federal Reserve Reserve increased the discount lending rate. This sparked a 33% decline in US stocks between their peak in September and their lows in November. Investors whose life savings had shrunk by a third became uncertain about their future financial prospects. And this reduced spending caused a number of firms to reduce production and lay off employees. In the 1920s, the great American word was prosperity. Now the 30s have begun and there is a new word, depression. Now, the crash and indebtedness of Americans led to the country's worst recession, a Great Depression lasting 10 years with global effects. 
We can learn many things from the Roaring Twenties. One that stands out is the danger of excessive debt in an economy. Even where there seems to be prosperity, it's important to remain level-headed. As Warren Buffett says, to fear when others are greedy. These words would have come in very handy during the dot-com bubble, 1995 to 2000, the US. The dot-com bubble is characterized by the boom in prices of certain internet companies in the late 1990s. Pets.com, Boo.com, eToys, all of these companies captured on the excitement of the new internet age. These companies were priced with an internet premium. Early stage companies in growth industries tend to require lots of seed capital before they can begin turning profit. Imagine I started a dot-com company that sells potatoes online, called potato.com. Maybe the first step is to do market research. Do people want to buy potatoes? Is selling potatoes a profitable enterprise? Then I might buy some farmland and potato seeds, plow the ground and plant them for the next season. But this is a dot-com company. So the first thing I need to do is pay someone to build me a flashy website. Then I spend even more money on a large scale marketing campaign to sell my potatoes. Television, prints, a potato puppet mascot to sell my potato wares. Because it's an internet company, investors are simply foaming at the mouth to get their hands on ownership in the business. And this is how so many of the dot-com companies of the time began. Promises of fortune using new internet technology without a viable business model. Beneath the veneer of flashy new internet technology, I'm still just selling potatoes. The dot-com bubble can be identified in hindsight through the use of a financial metric called the price to earnings ratio. It's a simple measure of a company's price relative to its profits. The higher the PE ratio, the more expensive a company is considered relative to its value. The S&P Composite, on average, sits at a historical PE ratio of 17 times. And during the dot-com bubble, this ratio peaked at 44 times in December of 1999. Companies were basically being valued at 44 times their annual profit. Eventually, investors began to see the overinflated prices for what they were, and the bubble burst. Unprofitable companies like Pets.com quickly collapsed without the ability to raise new investment. While the bubble had a muted impact on the US economy, the stock market took a heavy hit. The Nasdaq Composite, which is an index that tends to have a high exposure to technology stocks, fell 77% from its peak in 2000 to its low in 2002. The biggest learning from the dot-com bubble for investors is to not get caught up in the hype of new technology. Any investment decision should still be grounded in reality rather than being based purely on hope. And aside from this, the bubble left investors more wary of internet technology companies and created a glut of unemployed programmers. But the next bubble would have much more global implications. And then that happens. What is that? That's America's housing market. The global financial crisis, 2007 to 2008 worldwide. The GFC had everything to do with housing. Favorable economic conditions such as low interest rates and inflation helped push up house prices in the mid 2000s. Rising house prices encouraged more people to invest in and build new properties. Economic cycles usually involve some level of housing inflation, but the inflation in this cycle was exacerbated by the proliferation of a financial instrument called the Mortgage Backed Security, or MBS. The MBS effectively commoditizes people's housing arrangements. It bundles together hundreds of mortgage loans into a single security like a bond. MBSs tend to have better returns than bonds because individual mortgages are higher risk than government or corporate backed bonds. Additionally, they were advertised as being highly diversified, potentially holding thousands of mortgages in a single bond. Now, the investment market got even more complicated with the advent of the CDO or collateralized debt obligation. Now, this was a bundle of mortgage backed securities securities that had a low credit rating, i.e. the mortgages with the highest risk of borrower default. Because CDOs held another bundle of mortgage-backed securities, they were considered diversified. Rating agencies gave them high credit ratings, indicating a low risk of borrowers failing to pay back their loans. The MBS and CDOs became extremely popular investment vehicles, and banks were incentivized to create as many as possible. This meant handing out loans with little discrimination against borrowers. Instead of checking borrowers' financial position and ability to repay the loan, lending standards became lax. Low quality mortgages were trading well above their fair value. Eventually, when mortgage rates began to rise, owners began to default on their mortgage payments. 
These mass defaults led to a domino effect that ripped through the financial system and crippled a number of Wall Street's banks. The devastation of the GFC brings to mind an important lesson. Prior to the GFC, housing was considered a safe bet because the housing market always goes up. In reality, it's important to know that there is no such thing as risk-free return, and even safe investments carry risk. It also involved the first widespread use of quantitative easing by central banks, a method of propping up the economy by creating new money used to fund government debt. This method of monetary policy was widely used in the everything everywhere bubble, 2020 to 2022 worldwide. COVID-19 and its aftermath have been considered another bubble, a bubble of everything. Central banks are usually tasked with keeping an economy stable by preventing recession or reducing its impact and keeping inflation low. However, when COVID-19 occurred, central banks around the world took the first part of this role a little too seriously. They did this by printing money. It's estimated that during 2020, approximately $3.3 trillion was printed in the US alone. And we don't necessarily mean printing physical cash here. Here's Fed Chairman Jerome Powell to explain quantitative easing further. We print it digitally. So we, you know, we as a central bank, we have the ability to create money uh, digitally. And we do that by buying treasury bills or, or bonds or other government guaranteed securities, and that, that actually increases the money supply. Propping up the economy by printing trillions of dollars worked for a time. And many lockdown resilient technology companies like Netflix, Google, and Amazon recovered quickly in the aftermath of COVID's outbreak. Warren Buffett uses a long-term measure of whether or not a stock market is priced appropriately called the GDP to market capitalization index. This index is the market capitalization of the Wiltshire 5000 index, a broad measure of US stocks divided by global GDP. Now there's something very intuitive about this index. Companies create economic output and therefore their value should have a close relationship to GDP. At the end of 2021, that ratio sat at 200%, significantly higher than its historical average of 75%. Now that is until 2022. With the effects of COVID-19 well and truly over in the Western world, the glut of savings throughout the two year period were spent. Compounded by the war in Ukraine and supply chain disruptions, inflation spiked and prices rose rapidly. To curb this rapid price rise, interest rates were increased from historic lows with the goal of reducing borrowing in the economy. All of a sudden, homeowners were again forced to reduce spending. Now this bubble is also characterized by a sort of tech crash 2.0, whereby some of the leading internet giants who performed incredibly strongly in the COVID-19 aftermath plummeted back to earth. The crash in prices were somewhat indiscriminate. It seems like every sector and every asset class were in the red, hence the everything bubble. There is still debate as to whether or not there was a bubble in 2020 to 2022, because bubbles can really only be identified in hindsight. Tell us what you think in the comments below. Was the 2020 to 2022 period really a bubble of everything? Hindsight is 2020 when it comes to identifying bubbles and only time will tell which part of the market will be driven by irrational exuberance in coming years. But there is plenty to learn by studying these bubbles from tulip fever to the devastating GFC. If you want to learn more about the history of financial markets, bubbles, or how to invest, consider subscribing to this channel for more content or check out our website here. Thanks for watching and we'll see you again in the next video.